General Polakowski is nationally recognized for her leadership in the science and technology community, and she currently sits on the board of directors at Raytheon Technologies. Wow. Ladies and gentlemen, on the subject of women in the Air Force, please welcome General Polakowski. Ma'am, over to you. Well, thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me uh, to come and speak with you today. You know, I have been retired now for a little over three years, and half of that time has been as a uh, part of our, our new normal of uh, COVID isolation. And so I have made many attempts to try to get up to Dayton to visit. Um, I was going to run in the Air Force half marathon, um, but I canceled that after some Delta issues down here in Georgia, Delta variant of COVID, I should say. And I was uh, also uh, had looked forward to coming to the Air Force Museum where dedication of the women's piece and, and that was derailed. So I guess this is the closest I can come to getting back to see, to visit with my fellow airmen from um, whether in Dayton or around the rest of uh, AFMC. Uh, you know, when I was asked to speak, um, they said, well, what would you like to talk about? And I thought back to uh, General Mark Welch when he was the commander of, uh, when he was the chief of staff of the Air Force. And he always talked about the fact that every airman had a story and that we shouldn't be afraid, that we should share our stories and share our experiences so we could all learn um, from each other. And since I've retired, I've had a chance to reflect on my story. And I was um, surprised when I laid out um, the, my experiences, how much it actually follows the last 30 some years of the integration of women into our Air Force, in particular, our Air Force Officer Corps. So what I thought I would do today was to share my story as an airman and to reflect with it in the context of the history of women from my perspective, which you might find is not necessarily tied to some of all the milestones that people often think about when we talk about uh, women in the Air Force. So let me go ahead and get started and tell you my story. I will share my screen here. My story is titled being the only woman in the room because as General Bunch pointed out, there were very, the, his experience with very few women. I had the same experience. In fact, I was thinking as he talked about it, my very first woman supervisor was Secretary Deb, Debbie Lee James when I was a four star. She was the very first person that I had as, as a woman that was my supervisor. Um, so, it was not unusual for me through most of my career to find myself as the only woman in the room. But let me start, if you will, a little bit from the beginning. Because you see, it really all of us start with where our families brought us. I was born in New Jersey in a suburb of Newark. And my parents, my dad was a first generation American who had gone to school on the GI Bill from World War II. And he was, was very much influenced by losing his father when he was in high school and watching his sister have to drop out of school and go and work and clean houses in order to support his mother who really, I don't even know if she ever spoke English. So allegedly she did, but I could never understand her when she spoke English because she had come over here when she was 16 through Ellis Island. And so he was determined that all four of his daughters were going to be able, were going to go to college and that they were going to be prepared to take care of themselves. And so when I was talking about what I wanted to do and I wanted to be a journalist, he would tell me, no, no, you'll starve to death if you're a journalist. You have to be able to take care of yourself. You should go to engineering school. Now, my mother was born with a bad heart. Now, nowadays, that would have been treated by by surgery, but when in 1928, when she was born, she wasn't given much of a chance to live. My grandmother was told she would never live past 16, and she would certainly never be able to have any children. She lived her life 
with the view that do what you need to do today. Do what you want today. Don't wait because you don't know you could be gone tomorrow. And she lived her life with that motto. So when I just entered uh, college, I left with the view that I, if there was something I thought I wanted to try, that I should not hesitate and try it, and that I should be an engineer so that I could be able to take care of myself. Little did I know that being an engineer and being an Air Force and joining Air Force ROTC was something that women didn't do because that was not something that was relayed to me by either of my parents. So one of my messages that I continue to give uh, young mothers that come to me and talk about their, their daughters and how proud they are about how they are good at math and how they were terrible at math and, and isn't it wonderful that they're doing this? And I would always say, stop telling them that you were terrible at math. Don't make it sound like it's something unique and different to enter into a field where the women are not prevalent. Make sure that you tell your children that the opportunities are there for them and that they can seize them. But that was not necessarily the case for women when I entered ROTC. And as I mentioned earlier, I, when I reflected back on my career, I was, was surprised as I looked at how much the Air Force had changed in the way it approached the integration of women, or if you will, the term diversification of, the, of, of our force um, in the time that I served and just how unusual it was when I entered into ROTC in 1974, as a matter of curiosity, by the way, I didn't have any other strong interest in the military. I was just kind of curious about what it was about. And so if we look at, at the history of some of the key events in my mind that changed the course of women in the military, it starts with 1970 when ROTC was first open to women. Before that, the only way you could become an Air Force officer as a woman was to go through OTS. And this one, and, and, and the next one was in 1971 when you could ask for a waiver to stay on active duty if you got pregnant. Now, let me repeat that. Before 1971, if you got pregnant, you had to, you were discharged. And in 1971, that was the case unless you requested a waiver. So it's of no surprise that when I entered ROCC in 1974, one percent of the women's officer corps, of the officer corps was women. In 1976, opportunities for women made a significant uh, step forward when women were allowed to enter the United States Air Force Academy. And one of uh, my predecessors, Jan uh, General Janet Wolfenberger, was part of that first class of 1976. Why is that significant? It's significant because the, the military academies are such a critical part of building the culture and the partnership and the relationships that military officers preserve throughout their whole career. And by being able to enter into that environment four years early while you were in, in training was a significant step forward in the integration of women into the officer's corps. In 1977, women could enter pilot training. Not very many could enter pilot training. You could only uh, fly aircraft that were not in combat. So it was a very limited number of places. Well, I was commissioned in 1978. And by that time, because of some of the things that were going on, four and a half percent of the, of the officer corps were women. And in 1980, while I was still in, in graduate school, I was in, in the reserves for the four years I was in graduate school, I married another military member. At that time, there was no such thing as a joint spouse program. You basically, if you got married to another military member, it was up to you to see if you could find assignments together. And it was made absolutely clear to you for me in particular, that my husband was a B-52 radar navigator and 
his assignments took precedence over mine and that I should expect that we would likely face separations. And what we had to do was try to find our own assignments and convince the Air Force that we, um, that it was a good thing for them to uh, station us together. We had our first child in 1984. Now in 1984, there was very limited childcare arrangements around Air Force bases. If you had, a, it, there were childcare centers, most of them were only available for eight hours a day. And now when you think about the expectations of, of, of a work life, um, eight hours a day was the absolute minimum I was ever expected to be there. And that didn't count travel time to get back and forth to the childcare center. And, there, what, and forget about the fact if you had to bring your, your children to, uh, uh, to school or to, a class or, or to a doctor's appointment. In 1989, there was a significant change with the passing of the Military Child Care Act. And what was significant about that was it increased the opportunities for structured and certified childcare around military bases. And that was when it was first introduced to have women that were military spouses um, be able to open up childcare uh, in their homes. And so we had home childcare and also increased the, uh, the funding and the education and the training of childcare providers and the childcare facilities. In my mind, this was a significant uh, change for the opportunities for women in the, um, in the military because of the fact that we could now go to work, go on duty, knowing that our children were in a safe environment, which was always so critical to me and one of the hardest things I dealt with every time we changed uh, duty assignments. In 1992, my husband had the opportunity to separate from the Air Force. And in that regard, I no longer had to deal with the challenges of, um, of, a, uh, of trying to uh, be assigned together. And in 1993, the first woman joined and became combat pilots. Now, this was a little late for me. First of all, I didn't have eyes that could qualify to be a pilot. But by this point, I was already a uh, coming up. Uh, I was already a lieutenant colonel. Um, and uh, I made colonel in 1995. And then in the 2000s, there were significant changes that were made to both uh, arrangements, or both uh, being um, dealing with, with bringing children into military families and the joint spouse program. Tremendous changes that recognize the value of, of working with joint spouses to be able to bring them together and to, make, to try to find a balance to provide opportunities for both. This was a recognition of the importance of being able to, to not have to pick which, which military spouse Took, uh, took priority and also recognize the importance of the work-life balance that is so critical that we all recognize today. And then, as I mentioned, each one of these times as I entered a new rank, less than 4% of that rank was women. And, and, but yet when I reflected back, when you look at the things that happened to change the environment for women, there were many, many institutional block roadblocks that do not exist today. That's not to say the journey isn't over, but there's been just tremendous changes and improvements that recognize the importance of equity and inclusion for women in the military. And I might point out, as I was listening to General Bunch about diversity um, and how um, in, in AFMC, as I look at my timeline here, there's another growth that I saw during that time, and that was the value of our civilian workforce. And I know you have a chance to talk to Ms. Pat Z. And when I entered ROTC and throughout my early career, civilians were as about unusual as unusual in the environment as women were. And yet when I was a four star and I would sit around Corona and we would talk about uh, different issues, it was often me that I would say, hey, don't forget about our civilians. And in fact, at my retirement ceremony, uh, General um, uh, Goldfein highlighted, he called me the conscience of the Air Force when it came 
to our civilians. So the civilian story is very similar in terms of the one that you see here today. And maybe Pat might be able to talk to you a little bit about that during her presentation. In the beginning years, it was me entering ROTC and yes, I was the only one. In fact, it took several months before I actually got a uniform when I joined ROTC because they waited around to see if I was actually gonna stick around. And in fact, my, my journey into um, getting in, into a uniform was actually to get into a staff car with the supply NCO and travel about 50 miles to McGuire Air Force Base and go into clothing sales. And it was almost like the blind leading the blind. He knew nothing about women's uniforms. I knew nothing about women's uniforms as we went around the clothing sales to try to pick out uniforms that would fit me. The picture in the middle there is my ROTC commissioning class. There's a couple of things I wanna point out to you. First of all, validation, I am the only woman in the room. And second is there's only a few of us because this was at just post Vietnam War and the Air Force was going through, it's what I call my first downsizing opportunity. Then on the far right is a picture of my wedding day and my husband and I, as I mentioned, when we got married, um, and we sought to find our first joint spouse assignment, and I put quotes around joint spouse. We were able to get it because my husband, after multiple phone calls, found an NCO that was responsible for assignment of B-52 radar navigators, and he sent her, you notice I said her, a dozen roses to get in order for, so that he could get the one assignment that was in Sacramento since my assignment was to McClellan. And that's how we got our first joint spouse assignment. The early years, I can't say were easy. It was very challenging. And I very often came very close to deciding to uh, finish up my career. And the far right of the pictures here is a woman by the name of General Wilma Vaught. And many of you may recognize her as the woman who basically founded and carried on her own shoulders the Women's Memorial, which is at Arlington. This picture was taken when she officially retired from that role at about, that was about five years ago. Well, I first met General Wilma Vaught in 1983 when she was a young uh, uh, one-star general. I think she was one of maybe two or three general officer, female general officers in the Air Force. And she came out to McClellan Air Force Base. And while she was out there, she volunteered to meet with all of the women officers. So all three of us met with her. And during that discussion, she laid out for us, she said, if you wanna be as success successful as me, you're going to have to be better than any of the men you work with. You're gonna to have to dedicate yourself to your career and to your job. You're not gonna be able to have children you're not going to be able to uh, be able to have a family. And I remember leaving that discussion very angry, thinking to myself, why was it that I couldn't have a family, whereas the men that I were working with could have a family? And I vowed that if I could prove her wrong someday, I would love to be able to do that. Um, well, she was right about a number of things. And if you think about when she grew up, 1971, you were discharged. Remember, 1971, this was 11 years later, things had changed, but that was not, that was the world she'd grown up on. She was right about working hard. I found that I had to be good. I had to be able to justify why they would accommodate things that were different because I was a woman. And in fact, um, when my first daughter was born, uh, the uh, over there in the left-hand picture, I got 28 days. It was not maternity leave. It was um, it was leave uh, uh, recuperation leave. It was not maternity leave, and I had a C-section with her. When I told my supervisor that I was pregnant with my second daughter, his response to me was, "Well, I hope this won't interfere with your ability to do your job." That was the attitude when it came to women in the military. In fact, shown here is a picture of me 
receiving the Company Grade Officer of the Year Award at McClellan Air Force Base. And you'll notice I'm wearing a maternity uniform. So I, and in fact, it was one of the very first maternity uniforms that had ever been designed. Proof that I had to be the best in order for them to be willing to accommodate, to accommodate the things that I needed to do in order to be, to fulfill my objective, which was to be able to have a family and also be in the military. And we continued to struggle with finding joint spouse assignments, but I will tell you that one of the strengths that came from these experiences was the tremendous importance of the love and support that I had for my husband. And also the support that I had from my family, which was the Air Force, not just the active duty members, but the spouses in both my assignment, both my units and those of my spouses. And I stayed and we kept, as you saw, as obviously, you know, I stayed. And each time as we progressed, things got a little bit easier as the Air Force began that journey of integrating us better into it. And I can't tell you, I can tell you that I got to do some amazing things, some things that I never in my wildest dreams would have thought this kid who grew up playing basketball on the streets of Newark and Bloomfield, because I grew up before Title IX was in place in high schools and we had no organized women's sports. Noting that, as I point out, as I will tell you that military is as much a part of our American culture as anything else. I got to do, as you heard, I got to, to uh, work on some amazing technology, the airborne laser, which by the way, was a place where many, many leaders in the Air Force came from. Our own Heidi Bullock, who I think is still on that, still a, uh, in charge director of contracting there, was one of my contracting officers. Uh, there was a Lieutenant Colonel Robert McMurray, who many of you know is a former, now retired commander of Air Force Life Cycle Management Center. In the 1990s, I got a chance to work on the anthrax vaccine and in preparation for vaccinating the force as a result of operations in Desert Storm and afterwards. And eerily, many of the challenges we face now, that now with the COVID vaccine, we saw then. I got the chance to launch satellites. How cool was that? And, uh, and I can now point to things like GPS and others and tell my grandchildren that I was a part of that. And I got to fly in a high performance jet. This is the kid who went into ROTC with no opportunity for a scholarship, no opportunity to fly. And I got to fly in an F-16 um, as when I, when I was the commander of AFMC. I got to do those amazing things. But I also got to experience many of the challenges that, um, that the Air Force focused. I lost my husband in 2010 and I was devastated. And I thought that my life was over in many ways. In my military career, I did not know how I was going to be able to continue. But it was my family, my military family that gathered around me and provided me the support. And that was important to me when in 2014, we lost seven airmen from Hanskin Air Force Base in an airplane crash in Afghanistan. And I went to the dignified transfer in Dover, Delaware and, and sat with young widows and shared with them the experience of how to rebuild as uh, talking widow to widow. And then sadly, I experienced six sexual assault cases during the time that I was a commander. What a terrible, terrible thing for our Air Force. No one, no one exits from one of these experiences um, from as in a better place most of which it totally undermines the trust and the unity that we have as airmen, a selfish, selfish thing that results in sexual assault. And it, and it, is one, it was one of the most challenging experiences for me to deal with because of the, just the tremendous impact it had on my family, the Air Force. I also sadly had to, to address four times during my career, force reductions and sit down with airmen who were good performers, who wanted to stay in the Air Force and tell them that they had, that they, the Air Force unfortunately 
no longer could keep them as part of the team. Once again, a breakdown in trust. And I hope we never have to live with another thing like the sequestration, which caused us to have to furlough, civ furlough civilians, caused us to have to draw down our forces and to force out uh, majors who were passed over twice at the 16, 17 year point. And then finally, along the discussion that General Butts talked about, I lived through our challenges, which continue today on diversity, equity, and inclusion. You heard, you heard about the challenge, he, General Bunch used the term diversity over and over, over and over again when he talked about this. But in my opinion, the equity and inclusion part is more important than the diversity part because you cannot have a diverse workforce without equity and inclusion. I show here a picture of a group of African-American AFMCers that asked me to take a picture with them when I was visiting Hanscom Air Force Base. And I show this picture because it was not unusual as I traveled around the command and I visited units to have uh, minority groups ask me to take a picture with them. And of course, I was always thrilled to do this and proud to be, able, proud to be asked but was always with an element of sadness because of the fact that, they, that these groups felt that they had to have a picture that was, that was separate than the rest. I, would, I welcomed a day when they, there would never be a need or desire for this type of picture because we would all be one AFMC, one family where we all embraced um, being part of this team. And we wouldn't even think about whether this was a kind of picture that we needed to take. But unfortunately, we are not there yet. And it's a journey that has to continue. So what did I learn from that? Well, I learned that my strongest influences were from my parents and my family. If it wasn't for the fact that my parents never told me there were things I couldn't do, I may never have decided to go to engineering school or even have taken that first step. I learned that I, many times there were doors that were closed to me and I had to find, look at the opportunities the world presented to me and take advantage of them and open up new doors and opportunities for myself. And I know it sounds cliche, but I have to tell you that journey was so important as looking at my whole person, my spirit, my faith, my social, my environment, my, my, the value of, of the family, and how important it was to me to use my technical skills to make the Air Force a better space. And that adventure never continues today. And oh, by the way, I'll finish with this. At my one-star promotion, I invited one General Wilma Vaught. And at the time, at one point, I asked her to stand up and I called my two daughters up to me side by side. I presented her a dozen roses and I said, I've been waiting 20 years to say this to you. You were wrong. These two are the most important stars in my life. But I will be forever indebted to her for what she did as a woman in the military and for that important mentorship she provided me that one day at McClellan Air Force Base in 1983. Thanks again for letting me speak and uh, over to our um, leads for questions and uh, anything and comments.